This is KC Sports Network, proudly presented by M Prize Bank. Hello and welcome into another edition of Three Ma. I am John Kurtz, joined by Cole Manbeck, and our special guest today is Brian Smoller, who is one of the play-by-play voices of K-State baseball. And if you've been paying attention, obviously you're aware K-State is in the Super Regionals for the second time in school history. And the first time since 2013, they're in Charlottesville taking on Virginia. And we're going to talk to Brian about uh, all things K-State baseball, get you ready for what's coming up this weekend. And Put into context what exactly <clears throat> K-State did last weekend, which was very much deserving of raising a glass, which, of course, you would raise a glass of Ben Holiday bottled in Bond bourbon from our friends at Holiday Distillery, or perhaps 360 Vodka as well. That is certainly an option from our friends at Holiday Distillery as well, but they're great K-State folks who support us here on the pod, so please do support them. Make sure you grab some for this weekend if you're going to be gathered around the TV to uh, to watch the Cats or listen to uh, to Brian on the radio as well. That's certainly a great option. And if you want to watch, you can also get out to the Kingdom Bar and Grill in Overland Park if you're in the KC area. Got a watch party over there. One of our great partners, $5 Wet Willy cocktails during the K-State games at the Kingdom this weekend, which is 360 Cherry Vodka, Black Cherry Rum, Razzmatazz, Lime Juice, Lemonade, and I assume that's Sprite, Cole. Cole type Sprite. I assume that you get Sprite with that. Yes. Uh, Sprite, but uh, uh, yeah, that's right. Okay. Also, neither of us have heard of Razzmatazz. We don't know exactly what that is. So report back, uh, those of you who go to the Kingdom Bar and Grill in Overland Park this weekend. That would be wonderful. Anyway, uh, Brian, we really appreciate the time in, in joining us here now that you are on the scene in, in Charlottesville. Uh, how do you put into context what uh, what last weekend was like for K-State to sweep through that, that regional in Fayetteville and, and just what it means for the program? Yeah, I mean, it was unbelievable. I, I you know... Looking back on it, I just, it wasn't that it wasn't unexpected. I mean, you went in with the highest of hopes, right, that you were going to try and pull something off like that. But pardon the uh, guy that's uh, doing a little yard work over here in front of the hotel. But the, uh, at the end of the day, you go in and everyone gave case. I think the, the College Baseball Nation, which does a great job of breaking down odds for postseason baseball, they gave K-State an 8% chance of, making the regional final and they gave them a one percent chance of winning the regional so you knew that the odds were long arkansas had been just unbelievable playing all year and especially on the mound so you knew the odds were long but you went in with high hopes that a reset could happen and there were some signs i guess down at arlington that casey was starting to come back around a little bit and so the positive side of me was thinking now oh, here we go you know we'll just be you just take one game at a time see what happens and I think K-State matched up well with La Tech and boy did they have approved that and after that first game you me the eternal optimist I was like K-State's back I mean K-State has clearly moved through the toughest part of this this journey which is a you know 12 hour rain delay and both times came out red hot against some of the things that had been their kryptonite, which are left-handed pitching. And then you were playing with House Money when he went to Arkansas or played Arkansas that night. So by the time you get to the end of the journey, it wasn't surprising because at that point, K-State had been playing so well over three days that he didn't, it didn't surprise that they could keep it rolling. But I guess in reflection, what they did was pretty amazing. And that's where it kind of hit you at, as you walked out of the stadium that night or laid your head down the pillow that, holy cow, they just went in here and knocked off three teams and did it pretty dominantly uh, against three teams in all phases of the game. It gets you pretty excited about the future. Yeah, and facing one of the best pitchers in college baseball, if not the best pitcher in college baseball to do so, I mean, that game specifically, to go after a guy that had not given him more than three runs in a game, tap him for six in, in one inning, obviously the Kalen Culpepper home run was, was incredible. Just for people that are more casual, don't watch college baseball a lot, like how crazy and incredible was that game where does it rank like in terms of school history in terms of the biggest wins in school history it'll be up there it will be up there for sure now you know it didn't necessarily give k-state the championship winning that game because you at the time even if you beat had beaten arkansas the thought was well you're still gonna have to beat them two out of three you know to get out of here because you assume that arkansas would come back to the back side and, and beat southeast missouri and then you'd face them again that Sunday night, and then it would become a best of two series basically after that. But as we said before the game, the thought was Arkansas, Hagan Smith was so very good. I mean, he's going to be a top of the first round pick. I mean, some 
some models have him going in the top three picks. You know, left got, left-handed guys that throw 97 miles an hour with a slider like that and strikeout numbers like that don't grow, don't come around very often. We had one here a couple years ago in Jordan Wicks, but even he didn't have the stuff that this guy does. And he he's pretty good. He is really good. Now, I will say uh, what's an interesting stat, kind of maybe to drive home just how special K-State was that day. This is for a Pete Hughes special, so I'll give him credit. But the first inning or the first start of the year, he gave up six runs in a start. K-State touched him up for six runs in his last start. He gave up 10 runs all season in between, which is mind-boggling over an entirety of a season, especially in college baseball in the era that we live in with, with hot baseballs that are flying out of the yard. He hadn't had a game like that. And I think when Culpepper hit that home run, he was as in much shock as anything. And it seemed like it broke the spirit a little bit of Arkansas, and certainly the fans who were in a college football frenzy in that stadium when Culpepper hit the home run. Because at that point, with an Arkansas offense that, yes, had been playing better, the journey for them to get back into the game was going to be very steep going against Tyson Neighbors. That, yes, they made it close, but there was never a moment where you thought, all right, they're going to do this. They're going to pull this off and come back. It just never felt like that the rest of the game. So uh, it it's up there. It's this special win, no doubt. And then to finish it off against a red-hot Southeast Missouri offense, back-to-back, those are some two pretty special wins that will rank right up there with the last time K-State beat Arkansas back in 2013. Yeah, and I think, Ryan, it was certainly huge for Kansas State in the bottom half of that inning after Arkansas took that 2 nothing lead just to answer back immediately in the way that they did. Really impressive. I'm just curious from an atmosphere standpoint, how did that atmosphere Saturday night at Arkansas stack up or compare to games that you've called in your career? It's up there. I mean, one of the great things about college baseball is that as a baseball fan myself, it's you get the college factor to it that makes it more more exciting all right so you get the college basketball the college football feel the passion it becomes then baseball rides on every pitch you know it rides on every move it rides on every strategy that you put in be it a bunt play or a hit and run everything else is magnified because it has that emotion behind it and puts emotion in the game into the game that doesn't necessarily have it and there was a lot of emotion coursing through that building uh, on saturday night uh you know, seen some LSU places, seen some great places in the Big 12, especially this year. You know, going to West Virginia with Randy Mazey, the head coach there, is announcing his retirement. He's ending his season and long coaching career at the end of this season. And that place was emotional for three days in Morgantown. And it was packed all three days. I think they get 6,000, 5,000, 6,000 in that stadium. And it was charged all three days. K State was lucky to get one win there. And so you had a little bit of experience with what that's like. But this was on a whole other level. And, I mean, you got the hog pen out there in left field. That's like um, the the south end in at Sporting Kansas City games. I mean, it, it's, uh, it was unbelievable. They're on a whole other level. I mean, Chuck Inger probably heard more things being hurled at him in left field the whole night than, than he's had in his entire career. It was interesting. Pete had talked to the guys beforehand about, you can't interact with it. Like you just have to wear it and you just have to accept it. Like, because what they want is for you to acknowledge it, like turn around, tip your cap or say, Hey, you know, or fire something back. And, uh, I remember looking out there a few times, just thinking, boy, poor Chuck, he is just out there wearing this and he can't turn around and like smile or laugh or do anything. Cause it'll just encourage it even more. But, uh, it was electric. It was pretty sweet. And then when there's nothing better, as you guys know, in a college football environment or college basketball environment, you go on the road in a raucous place and you shut it down because you're the road team and you've done well. There's nothing better than that. And there were a lot of sad and very frustrated Hog fans walking out of that stadium that night, and it was pretty sweet. Well, what better weekend than this weekend with K-State in the Super Regional to uh, break out your home field apparel? If you don't have it, get to homefieldapparel.com and, uh, you know, maybe get the expedited shipping. Make sure it gets here in time for the games this weekend. But you can get all the best K-State retro gear, uh, 50-plus designs at homefieldapparel.com. If you're looking around, you want to get another school like Derek, you can go to 100-plus other options that they have. They've got basically everybody covered. 
believe I saw they even they've got like a UC Santa Barbara banana slugs shirt. I think I saw it going around on Twitter the other day, which was pretty cool. So uh, look, whatever you want, they've got it. Homefieldapparel.com and you can get 15% off your first order using promo code 3 ma 23 Again, that's promo code 3 ma 23 to get 15% off your first order at homefieldapparel.com. We appreciate you supporting KC Sports Network by listening to our podcast. You have helped us become the highest ranked Chiefs podcast network in 2022 and 2023. And don't forget about our daily Substack newsletter, the best written analysis you can find on the Chiefs straight to your inbox every day. KCSN.substack.com. Well, you mentioned Chuck, Brian, and I was going to ask you about him. Obviously, a huge get in the transfer portal this offseason. Was off to a great start the first half of this season, hitting the ball, then went into a major slump. He goes 7 for 11 this last weekend, two homers, seven RBIs in the Fayetteville Regional. How significant was his reemergence last weekend? Do you think the slump was was maybe just a mental thing, and now he's back to form? And what does that mean for this baseball team if he is back to form? I 100% believe it was a mental thing. Uh, you know, one thing about this team, and we can get into this later if you want, but this staff is over the top when it comes to data analysis and using statistical sort of performance and, and deep dive on analytics to prepare this team. I, I've never been around a baseball team or a staff that is this much into scouting as this team is. And I think that'll help them this weekend. We can get into that later. But they gave all the tools to Chuck all throughout the season and work with him. And he would have great weeks of practice and, and, and be there locked in. And it was just the performance and games. And some of it was bad luck. That's baseball. Sometimes you hit things hard and they go right to a glove. Or sometimes you run into an umpire that's got a strike zone that doesn't favor what you're looking for and what you're looking at the plate. But he just needed a reset a couple of days off. And I, Thomas Hughes, who is Pete Hughes' son, he's the – third assistant for K-State. He runs the third base coach spot. I'll give him credit. He he called it. He Prior to the week, we each went around the room. We were talking and and said, hey, what's your pick to click? And he he picked Chuck Ingram. And I, was, I remember texting him right before the first game. I was like, listen, I'm not going to say this on the air unless Chuck does well. But what? Why? Why did you pick Chuck? What was the indication? And he goes, I just, I've seen it before with guys like that. You're nearing the end of your career. You just needed to get away from it for a while. And he got away from it for a while, for about a week, before K-State started the postseason, came back, had a total mental refresh, and just came back hitting baseballs. And boy, did he look good. And from that swing where he had the home run, you should have seen the dugout. I mean, they were all over the rail. They're all waiting for him to come back around because he's kind of the straw that stirs the drink you know if he's going all of a sudden that lineup becomes deathly tough one through nine because he just provides so much electricity with the bat and uh, yeah it was awesome it was it was it was sweet seeing him hit the home run and uh coach thomas hughes i'm at the booth i'm reaching out of the booth i'm pointing down at him he's pointing at me i mean we're like yeah you called it and and then he just goes off from there and uh, it's pretty sweet to see, and hopefully can keep going another week here in Charlottesville. And I think it will. I mean, he seems like he's got his swagger back, and with that, the team does as well. Well, this may play off of some of that, but you know, the, the last couple of years, this team has been painstakingly close to getting to the point where they were last weekend into a regional. Now, obviously, this team broke through. The non-conference scheduling was was definitely a big part of that too that helped out. But to get through, and then win the regional the way that they did like what what separates this team from the last couple of teams that have been so close you know I mean it didn't seem like in the regular season there was a ton of difference necessarily but you're somebody that's there close to it every single day so what's different about this this team that's given them this chance I I would say that the mental toughness from this team is the difference and that's not to slight the other two teams I would think you would, it takes a special group of guys to be able to play the schedule the case they did and come out of it and be able to be to reset themselves and get ready for postseason. I, I think they were striving and pushing so hard through the month of April and May through just a slog of a schedule. I mean, only five home games in April. I mean, who does that, especially at the Power 5 level? Nobody. I mean, nobody played that tough of a road schedule. And of those 19 road games that K-State played during that stretch, 
13 of them are against top 40 teams at their place. I mean, it's just, uh, you know, you don't do that in college baseball for the reasons of why we saw you just get beat down by everybody else's best pitchers at their home place. So, and I think it took a toll. It certainly zapped this team, but you have to have some sort of mental inner belief to be able to get to the postseason and brush all that aside and reset yourself, and that has been the difference between this team and other teams. And I'm not saying that there, other teams may have been more talented. You know, John, you referenced some of those the last two of the three years. I mean, you had Jordan Wicks and and some really good pitching staffs on those teams. And offensively, last year, K-State may have had a little more pop last year than they have this year. But there's something about this group with Cole Pepper and Ingram and everybody else. They have just got that it factor. And they've been able to get to the postseason. They threw the gorilla off the back of finally getting here, and they've played loose since. And I think it's freed them up. Well, Cole mentioned Chuck Ingram kind of getting right. I mean, Ty Rule on the mound is somebody that I know has, has had a tough year and someone that has a really high ceiling. Um, in case State obviously is going to need all the pitching they can get against a team that can really swing it in, in Virginia this weekend. But uh, does he seem like he is now back on track? And, and how key is that to what's going to happen this weekend? I love the performance by Ty Rule, another guy that it's been in there all year. And I, it's interesting, his journey, he talked about it a little bit this week in that press conference. You know, he gets injured early in the year. And I don't know if he, I mean, he said forearm strain. So he laid it out there. Anytime you're dealing with a pitcher and he gets a forearm strain, that's usually, that's caution flammable, right? I mean, everybody starts freaking out at that point because that's usually a precursor to the dreaded Tommy John. And so I think there were a lot of people that thought, oh, that's that's not good for him. And I think he also believed the same thing. Now, Blaine Burris, K-State's trainer, fantastic, unbelievable job and work with them. And they did all the testing. They did all the imaging and it all came back clean. And it said, hey, Ty, you're going to be OK. You're going to be fine. Just go out there and cut it loose. And I don't think he could ever get to that point where he knew he could just cut it loose and and feel confident that he wasn't going to hurt himself. And it got to the postseason, it came to this regional, and after looking at the bullpen and then realizing, you know what, everybody else is resetting here in the postseason at Arlington, I think I'm going to be okay. They pitched him a few times at Arlington in the bullpen session, and he's got as good a stuff as he had at the beginning of the year where he was going to be K-State's number two starter. And then it put him in the game, and Matt mentioned this on the air, Matt Walters, uh, the last time that he had pitched in a game like that was almost a year ago in Arlington in a must-win game against Texas as K-State tried to make the semifinals of the Big 12 championship, and he went like seven innings and was just utterly dominant. And so there was kind of this idea that I think if you put him in there, he's going to do it again, and sure enough, now he didn't go six innings, but against an offense that was completely on fire and had nothing to lose in Southeast Missouri. He shut him down for four innings and and looked very much like the tie rule we remember. Now, is he going to do it again? I, I, you know, I can't promise you that pitching in baseball is, is a funny deal, but he also, and talking with him on the flight here and, and around the hotel, another guy that seems to have found it again and found it back and, and be a guy that's going to be key and he's ready to go. And I think Key State's going to use him, at least initially, as a swing guy out of the pen to bridge that gap at Tyson Neighbors, you're not asking Tyson to go four innings again. You know, I, I think he'll take the old Jackson Wentworth role that Jackson did early in the year and be kind of that setup guy. So you have Dean and Rule now coming out of the pen to get you to Tyson Neighbors, and that's a pretty good one-two punch against this Virginia offense. Well, you mentioned Jackson Wentworth. I got to ask you about him, Brian, because just how impressed have you been by him and transitioning from a dominant reliever now as to the second guy in the rotation who's performed like a stud. We know he's a guy probably going to get taken in the top five rounds of the draft, but just how significant of his has his emergence been for this team this year? Huge. Uh, and um, you mentioned the top five rounds. Uh, we visited with the scout. His last home start was against BYU. His best start of the year, eight innings, 11 Ks, and, and what he could have I mean, he had no hit stuff. Now, BYU was lucky enough to get a couple of hits off of him, but he was unbelievable that night. And there was a scout. There were many scouts there, but I talked with one that I knew, and he said, don't be surprised if Jackson Wentworth gets taken late first, early second round ahead of Tyson Neighbors. And I was like, wait a minute, why? And he goes, unbelievable stuff. And to be able to do what he's done, pitch both out of the pen 
as a lockdown closer and now show it as a unbelievable top of the rotation starter, there are very few guys that can pull that off and be able to handle it. Baseball is such a mental game. You know, it's such a, it's such a game that, you know, you got to survive the ups and downs. And Jackson had a lot of downs last year coming off Tommy John surgery. And you don't know how guys are going to react from that. You know, some guys never find it again. Other guys in college, they are two years out. Suddenly they find it again. And he did. And I think a lot of work with Rudy Darrow, K-State's pitching coach, who is a, a phenomenal sort of mind guru, along with being a very big data data analytics guy. They reworked some of Jackson's pitches, got a little more spin and RPM on some of his spin, and he's been mowing guys down. And uh, he's got tremendous stuff. The fastball is a 3,000 RPM spinner. And, I mean, that you know, data analytics, that's, that's major league stuff. Uh, he's got a great changeup. And then his curveball, you don't see it much anymore to these days, but it's a top-to-bottom curveball, and it's tight in the zone. So, I mean, his spin, again, is around 3,000 on that curve. Um, I mean, you're... When you're spinning off pitches that fast, that those are major league ready. And he he has been fantastic. That was not an easy environment to pitch in last week against Hagen Smith. And K-State basically asked him, hey, keep us in the game through five innings. And he did more than that. He gave K-State a, a huge lead going to the sixth or into the seventh. So I, he's been impressive, very impressive uh, so far this year. Just being able to bounce back from a year ago and not have any sort of doubt that he would do it. That's that's tough to do when you're 19, 20 years old. As a golfer for years, I've been hearing PXG say nobody makes golf clubs like they do, period. Know what? They're right. I went in for a fitting and saw for myself. I swung all the PXG iron irons. I swung the PXG Black Ops driver. It's a total game changer. You no longer have to sacrifice distance for, for forgiveness. No matter how good the tools, getting fitted can take your game to a whole new level, and they'll even give you a dozen golf balls free just for doing it. The world-class team of PXG experts will analyze every expert or every aspect of your swing with every club and give you feedback in real time on how to improve. I went in for a fitting a couple weeks ago and it was so custom and personalized, first-class customer service experience. Took me to the back and uh, hit over 100 golf balls, hit about 60, 70 shots with the irons, let them, uh, you know, div- you know, mess around with that a little bit and work with my swing and make some adjustments to it. And then they set me up with a PXG Black Ops driver and uh, watched me swing. And every 10 swings or so, they were making some changes and adjustments to the driver, you know, adjusting the weight where it was distributed in the driver head, adjusting the angle of the shaft to customize and fit my swing best. They did all of that for me. And by the end of the day and the last 10 to 15 shots I was hitting, everything was going relatively straight and farther. It was a tremendous experience. Customer service was top notch. So get on over to PXG over in Overland Park. PXG made me a believer. They'll do the same for every golfer in Kansas City. Visit pxg.com slash stream on to schedule your fitting at PXG Kansas City. 7517 West 119th Street in Overland Park. Really cool facility. Get fitted for any club and you'll get a dozen golf balls free. That's pxg.com slash stream all to schedule your fitting. pxg.com slash stream all. Limit one dozen golf balls per person. Promotion ends June 30th. Other terms and conditions may apply. See the store for farther details. We appreciate you supporting KC Sports Network by listening to our podcast. You have helped us become the highest ranked Chiefs podcast network in 2022 and 2023. And don't forget about our daily Substack newsletter, the best written analysis you can find on the Chiefs straight to your inbox every day. KCSN.substack.com. When you look back to the last weekend and look ahead, Ryan, obviously they sweep all three games. So you play the minimum three games. Just obviously that's critical to advancing is to play the minimum number of games from a pitching standpoint, but also the ability now to reset your rotation, to not have to play a fourth or fifth game potentially last weekend. And you're able to fully reset for a, what is a normal weekend essentially now with your pitching staff. Just just how significant was it to minimize that to three games and now K-State's got the full arms and the arsenal fully rested heading into Charlottesville in the Virginia matchup? That's a good point, Cole. It's a big deal because Virginia did the same thing. So if you're going up against a team, especially at their part, and they've had multiple days of rest, as you said, been able to reset rotation, they only use four or five pitchers on the weekend. You want to be able to match that a little bit. I mean, you have the the difficulty of travel. You want to at least be as as rested and as full, ready to go as you can be. 
Yeah, that's why I'm encouraged for K State going into the super regional. I, you know, I don't know what's going to happen, but on paper, I think K State's got more than a shot uh, of winning this regional. The, you know, Virginia's no different than a lot of very top of the top of the Big Twelve teams. They certainly have played K State's schedule this year. They have played some incredibly difficult opponents already this year. I don't think they'll be intimidated. Certainly going into that environment and or by the, what they're going to face. Uh, but it's a different challenge, as you said. But I think being able to have all top arms rested, be able to have a bullpen that's fully rested, as you said, no one's taxed at this point. They've done a lot of work behind the scenes to keep guys sharp. Very excited to see what K-State can do on the mound. I think Rudy Darrow is, is incredibly unsung as a pitching coach and a reason behind K-State's success this year and last year. Uh, as they almost made the tournament, he has made a huge factor for K-State on the mound, just his ability as a pitching coach, you know, and just a wonderful man and a wonderful family man. But beyond that, his his sort of meshing with what K-State wants to do from a data analytics side, and then also being able to fine tune some guys and, and find different arm slots for pitchers that have unlocked their talent. Uh, it's been pretty cool to see. And I don't think he gets enough credit for what's called sequencing, uh, which is the pitch calling and the scouting. So everything that goes into scouting, he's the one that calls the pitches. He's the one that is delivering, you know, where K-State's throwing it and how they throw it during a game based on the the scouting that they've done, a deep dive on the opponent and the hitters that they have. It's a it's an advanced skill and he's very good at it. <laughs> it has allowed K-State pitchers to 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 be dominant at times this year. Well, Virginia, I mean, on paper, obviously, they're they're led by the offense. They've got a ton of it. Um, pitching staff, I mean, you look at their numbers, like Team ERA, pretty similar to what K-State brings to the table. How do you size up what, what the Cavaliers have? Obviously, a very proud program, but what they have specifically this year. They're a little bit like K-State on the mound. I'll start there first, in that they had a couple of guys that were dinged up early this year, uh, one, two of their weekend starters and then a key guy out of the pen, and so they... They sort of kind of mashed unit it throughout the year, and it 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 took a hit on their numbers for sure, and that's why their numbers are so out of whack. Now they they've been able to get back on kind of their role here at the end of the year. They've won thirteen of sixteen, seven of eight, largely because they've been able to get those guys in back to their role. So they've they got a pretty good rotation now of guys going to go five six innings. They got an eight inning performance from Jay Woolfork, who had a similar path to maybe a Jacob Frost for K-State. Frost is really str- has great stuff, but has struggled throughout the year, and all of a sudden it magically unlocks in the postseason uh, for this Jay Wolfork, uh, Wolfork cat that pitched last weekend. And uh, So we'll see if he can do it two games in a row if he pitches Sunday. But uh, So in that regard, they've gotten a little bit better pitching, I think, the last three games than they, than they wanted. On the other side, they didn't hit it very well here at home last weekend against uh, Penn and Mississippi State. They only hit 245 as a team. And um, they did score nine runs in the last game, but six of those came in the last ninth inning when Mississippi State kind of ran out of pitching. So curious to see what this offense will be like. Now, all season, they are a team that have done a lot of hit and run, gap-to-gap hits. They can hit it out of the ballpark. They can steal bases. They remind you a little bit of that Oklahoma offense that went to the College World Series here a couple of years ago under Skip Johnson that won the Big 12. Uh, but they, they, they certainly are our challenge offensively. But I, you know, K State, the way they're playing right now, I don't know that you put much. Those of us that are on the program, you're walking around here thinking, give us the longest odds possible. Uh, we're ready for it. And College Baseball Nation right now uh, gives K State a six percent chance of winning this super regional. It's the lowest odds of any team left in the field of reaching the College World Series. Um, you know, the three unranked teams are all in under 10%, but K-State's at 6%, or the lowest one. So I think they've got that chip on their shoulder, ready to go out and prove it. Now they're going to start it with game one with Owen Borama, and they, we'll, see what, we'll see what happens. Yeah, what, what's the recipe to you for a K-State win this weekend? What, what needs to happen in order for K-State to be successful? I think if K-State comes out and shows offensively, John, that they're not missing a beat from last weekend, that will go a long way towards kind of continue. All right, almost a all right. Here we go. We're going again. You know, if they come out, it was almost like the restart for when K State had that long rain delay on Friday against La Tech, and they put up all those runs. 
you wondered, there was a part of you that wondered, how are they going to come out here on Saturday in a morning start, just seven hours after they just got done playing or got back to the hotel? Are they going to be able to really keep this momentum going from yesterday? And then Jaden Parsons, who's hit one home run all year and only two in his life as a baseball player, homers on the second pitch. And you're like, well, here they go again. And from that point on, they roll up 10 runs over three innings. So there's there's a part of me that kind of feels like that's kind of the same recipe to success here. They're going to bat first. You got a team that's kind of pitched it well last weekend, but throughout the season has had some doubts when it comes to the pitching mound. Can you jump on them right away and kind of get that sort of vibe in the dugout that we're not going to be beat again here this weekend and, and jump out to a 1-0 lead in this series? That's to me, would be the success route for the weekend. If you get up one game, all the pressure then jumps back on Virginia, and you're playing with house money, and all you got to do is win one of the next two. I think you're in good shape. And it's odd to see a Brian O'Connor team struggle on the mound, right, Brian? Because they've been top 15 in ERA in the country each of the last three years. I think they were fourth in ERA, team ERA, last season. I know they lost all their weekend starters, but uh, they have certainly struggled on the mound this year. Hey, I want to go back. You, you know this. Baseball is such a mental game, and you've already talked about that with Chuck Ingram and some of these guys. But as I think about the season as a whole, you know, they, they scuffled a little bit down the back half of the season, and then they get into postseason play and obviously just come out electric and dominate Louisiana Tech and outscore their opponents 33-12 to 12 this last weekend in Fayetteville. For, do you think they just, once they got into the postseason, they just hit the reset button here from an emotional mental standpoint? Like, I feel like there was probably a lot of pressure on these guys' shoulders with the expectations going into the season, a lot of weight on their shoulders. Hey, we got to make it to the NCAA tournament this year. And it just feels like once they got in, now the pressure is off a little bit. They just let loose. I mean, what, what are your thoughts on that? I think that's exactly what happened. Uh, exactly. And when you have one of the great things about Pete Hughes and his, this staff is they can really recruit. And I think they were able to find guys that are very talented. And so when you, in baseball, when you take emotion out of it and you take uh, fear out of the game and you just let your talent play, the results can be pretty amazing. And I think that's what you've seen with this team. This team is exceptionally talented. You know, you look back, and we talked earlier about what's the difference between this team and the teams of the last two to three years. There are major league guys on this team. All right, Kalen Culpepper is going to be a major league player. Tyson Neighbors is going to be a major league player. Jackson Wentworth is going to be a major league player. There are guys that would start for any other team in the Big 12 and others around the country. And Chuck Ingram, Brady Day, Brendan Jones, those are guys that are all Big 12 and would start anywhere in the nation type of guys. That hasn't always been the case at K-State. So in some respects, you're right. They did not hit that level throughout the year. They didn't just mow people down throughout the entirety of the season. You look at Arkansas, they just mowed people down with that upper level talent all season long and then kind of hit a wall at the wrong time. K-State hit their wall early. I don't know that that's advisable. Like I don't know that you... <laughs> necessarily want to do that but because of the way that's structured in college baseball where you have to hit an rpi number to get in the postseason it's just the way it is you have to build a schedule because you're geographically isolated like k-state you're gonna have to go play some people and it's gonna have to come in april um and you have to be able to survive that and you you're pushing and you're pushing and you're pushing to get to this hey we're super talented we know we're talented we know it so then you grip the bat a little harder and you swing a little harder the next time. And now you're a little bit off and you're fouling pitches off that you should be barreling up. And it just took a moment to, hey, we're in. We finally got rewarded for doing all this hard work. We're in and we can take a breath. Let's just go play ball. And when you have a guy like Cole Pepper and you have a guy like Ingram and Day and Jones, and they're all starting to get hot because we're just playing ball then you can do some special stuff. And it is fun to watch as a K-State fan, or as more just a college baseball fan, watch guys at the highest stage and when given the biggest moments come through and you're like, yep, this is the dude we saw the last couple of weeks um, in in March and then into April that is going to be a player and going to be a star. And then watch them do it on the biggest stage. It was pretty fun. Well, on the subject of the schedule that Pete Hughes assembled, I mean, just how well is that prepared this team for these moments like at Arkansas and at Virginia? When you think about UConn, even UConn has advanced to the Super Regional winning at OU the other night. You think about going to Northeastern, a top 40 RPI team that got 
didn't make the tournament, but was right there on the bubble, one of the last four teams, and they win that game. They go to Tennessee, Clemson, two top six seeds. Tennessee, obviously, the number one overall seed. Just the schedule that Hughes assembled, and then playing in the Big 12 too, Brian, how well has that prepared this team, and how key is that to to be ready for this moment? I think it's huge. You know, I think they talked about that essentially after the Arkansas game, that that was the biggest reason why they were able to survive that environment was playing the teams they played and playing the opponents they had to play. You know, I mentioned West Virginia before you mentioned Tennessee and Clemson and they got slammed at those two places. And it was early in the year, but it gave them an idea of what it's going to be like when you get to postseason and what they had to get to, to be able to win those games. Uh, playing UConn, a team that we saw is now also in the super regionals and played them at their place. That was a great game. Uh, between UConn and K-State. I really thought K-State was going to win that game, and they ended up not winning it at UConn's park. But that was kind of the first indication that week. K-State went to UConn, played even with them. They were starting to get hot at that moment. They kind of rolled it right on into the postseason, got them in, and then they beat Northeastern the next day. Then they came back home and took two of the three from Oklahoma State. That was the moment where you were like, okay, K-State's going to be all right. They're going to – it's it's going to be a tough – finish you know it's going to be maybe 50 50 here and there as far as getting through it but I think they're going to be all right and no doubt it helped prepare them and Pete Hughes has already said this is the future moving forward unless the NCAA gets to a point where they change the model of how you get in the postseason this is how KC it's going to do it we're going to schedule tough we're going to play anybody anywhere we're going to have that little chip on our shoulder and we're going to have to be like that in order to be in the postseason every year because just getting in now seems to be the key for K-State. Just get in the tournament and then go do what you do. Well, I'll leave you with this, Brian. I mean, one of the thoughts that I had in the immediate aftermath of of sweeping through that regional over the weekend was just just so, so damn happy for Pete, you know? I mean, Pete Hughes was such a great guy to be around when I was calling games in the program, just uh, an infectious energy. And, you know, he's been through a lot since he's been here, obviously with the close calls and not quite getting in. Just what are your thoughts on what it what it means to him and and how this kind of a breakthrough is is something that he's really been waiting for here? Yeah, he's he's such a great guy. He's got that northeastern, um, you know, quick wit and and humor, as you know, John. And boy, if there was ever a guy that I would love to get on a podcast, just unfiltered, it's Pete Hughes. I mean, his, his sense of humor uh, is great. It's uh, colorful at times, but. <laughs> He's got such a great rapport there, and he's so much fun to be around. And no doubt, that was one of the great sights and got you a little emotional at the end with seeing him be emotional. I mean, the guys dump him with Gatorade. They, they love him. They absolutely love him. Um, he fights for him all the time. He's ne- he's never negative. You know, he's always positive, trying to get them to be- reach the best potential of themselves. And to see him, well, I, I don't know that anybody ever got a shot of it, but Gene Taylor was down on the field, right? And it's that, it's that moment. We've seen it with football. We've seen it with basketball. But there was... Gene kind of fights his way through the crowd. It was like a movie, and he finds Pete, and it's a huge embrace, and it's this long embrace, and you can see the tears in the eyes of both men that took a chance on each other, you know, so to speak. Pete, you know, said he was going to not go anywhere where he couldn't find a way to get to this point with, and Gene Taylor was all in on the methodology that he wanted to go about doing it, and it, it has been, as you said, a slow burn, a couple of years of frustration here to the last three, not making the postseason. You wondered, are we going to do this or not under Pete Hughes? And then to finally get it and finally realize it all after all those months and years of hard work for the staff and for him, it was pretty cool. It was really cool. And uh, he's all smiles right now and and, and dropping one-liners left and right on these guys and, and uh, looking forward to seeing how they do this weekend for sure. On that subject, Brian, I mean, what would it what would it mean? to get to Omaha like do you allow yourself personally you've been calling K-State baseball for a long time do you allow yourself to dream a little bit of what it might be like to call games at the College World Series I try I'm trying not to call uh, you know you get to a point where you, you get almost neurotic about all right how did how did you approach it last weekend what clothes did we bring what what uh how did we sit in the booth how did we sit at breakfast you know you're trying you're, you're almost neurotic and trying to do that stuff Pete Hughes doesn't believe in any of that, by the way. He gets mad when you try and do that. He goes, none of that stuff matters. You know, it's all in the numbers and, and mm-hmm. stats. But um, but yes, Matt Walters and I both have talked about that. When In 2013, when we went to Corvallis to take on Oregon State, after winning the first game on the first day, we talked about it. Because then you have to talk about it. Then you got to talk about plans and travel schedules and what's it going to be like. And Because you're one win away. 
this time around, we're trying to be a little more judicious about it and try not to do that. But it's hard not to because this team, there's something different about them. Compared to the 2013 team, this is a team that's better on the mound than that team was. Maybe not as deep offensively through one through nine, but they are certainly better on the mound. And I think it's winnable. Uh, Oregon State was like the number two team in the country. <laughs> I mean, they were unbelievable that year with Michael Conforto in the outfield of playing for the Mets every day. Now, um, this team, I don't know. They, they, they've got some studs, but I don't know that they're – their strength is more than just overwhelming you with offense as opposed to just one or two guys are just going to kill you. So we'll see. But, yeah, you thought about it. What would it mean for the program? It's legitimacy. Guys, it's legitimacy. It'd be like making the college football playoff in football. It's legitimacy. It's uh, you, you become you can recruit a different level. You can it's making a final four in basketball. It's uh, it's the mecca. It's what you go into the whole thing for is to make Omaha because you talk about pitching rest, Cole. I mean, you get to Omaha, the games are so spread out. You can win. You can win the College World Series with three pitchers if you get there because you don't have to play the. The toughest round is the regional round, and if you can get through that, then it's at that point now it's all the, it's macho, it's mano y mano, your best three guys on the mound against their best three guys, and see what happens the rest of the way. And the Wildcats are built to be able to do that. And we'll see how they fare, um, but it, it's exciting yet scary and frightening to think about all at the same time as a guy that's on the side. You don't you're trying not to think of I don't want to plan out my call or any of that stuff. I don't want it to be all organic in the moment when it happens um, and, and just see where K-State lands and, and hopefully they're there in Omaha in two weeks and have a whole bunch of K-State fans coming up there with us. Well, I think the baseball gods kind of owe us all one after the way that ended <laughs> Corp Alice being as, as close as that was and speaking of Michael, you know, throwing out Blair DeBoer, that whole thing. So uh, if there is a baseball god out there that could uh, deliver something to K-State, I think you guys deserve it. And certainly we'll be uh, looking forward to listening to you this weekend and Watching the games, have a blast, and uh, appreciate you taking some time for us, Brian. Yeah, I appreciate it. No, uh, from your words to to uh, to God's actions, right? I mean, I hope that's the case. I hope that's the way it plays out, John. I, I you baseball is a funny game, and it has some parallels. I mean, I think if the Royals, right, they win a World Series, and it falls 20, 25 years, whatever it was, uh, from the last time they won a World Series, and here we are, we're 11 years to the day, the last time Casey's in the Super Regional, that's when they punched their ticket, and there's just some symmetry there, and um, they didn't get it done last time, can they get it done this time? I, I Boy, it just, it, it would, for a program that has, for the most part, never been associated with success, it would go a long way towards getting it done. I'll, I'll, t- I'll give you one more example. We got off the plane, we get into the hotel here today, there's a uh, uh, a, a little kids baseball tournament, little kids. I mean, they're probably, you know, 12, 10 to 12 year old kids that are playing a tournament here in, in, in Virginia. And there's a bunch of us staying at our hotel. We walk in the hotel. They lose their minds with their, that's case. They are all they saw was the KS we had. I had was where a couple of us were wearing shirts that say KS on the outside and they lose their minds saying that's Kansas state, Kansas state baseball stand at our hotel. And they're running around telling all their friends and immediately want to go and get autographs from our guys. And that's the that's the name recognition that comes with this point of the tournament. And it's good for the school, good for all levels. It's happened for people wearing the power cat, right, when you go around because it's football and basketball. To see it now with that KS baseball logo and have that internationally or nationally recognized that's pretty special for K-State. And that's what's on the line here this weekend and, and a chance to become... Uh, not just uh, leave a legacy, as these guys have talked about, but become legendary. Yeah, no doubt. A lot of guys, all the way back to Mike Clark, have uh, put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into it to get to th- this point for uh, for K-State. So, uh, Brian, have a blast this weekend, man, and we'll talk to you soon. All right, buddy. Thanks for having me on. Good to talk with you and Cole.